Sonia sent out messages to all of our speakers saying we would like to have a biographical sketch so that we could announce something about you before you spoke. Jack sent back very little. <laughs> Sonia, I think you should have written Brenda. And that would have been the lecture. <laughs> he said back that he had been a Christian for 36 years. They were members here for many years. And the last few years that they were here, he served as an elder of this congregation until they moved to Huntsville in 2014. He actually wrote Brenda, he and his wife Brenda. <laughs> now attend Fish Hatchery Road Congregation. Jack has spoken at various times, various places. We appreciate both he and Brenda. We appreciate him for his love for the truth, as it is for Brenda, their determination to do what is right as the Bible defines the right. Keeping with the idea that we're talking about the unity that is a must, to put it in another way, as taught in the Bible for those who would please God, he will be speaking on the topic of one Lord, one faith. Brother Jack, come speak to us. I think David's getting soft in his old age. When he told me he was going to ab lib, I was expecting a little more than that. <laughs> but thankfully, that was easy. I'm, I'm satisfied. <laughs> Actually, I wrote Sonia and said they just introduced me as the speaker formerly known as Jack. Anyway, uh, we're assembled here today, as most of you know, to discuss a unity that's demanded by Christ in the New Testament. Uh, and of course, the theme of the lectures. And we know, according to the sign right here behind us, that who's, uh, whatsoever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, Colossians 3.17. So understanding that the only unity that is acceptable to our Lord is that which is authorized by his word, the New Testament. So since I was taught to have a three-point sermon, and you only gave me two, one Lord, one faith, my first point is going to be the mandate for Christian unity. <laughs> you know, I thought I'd do, it'd do good to keep this in context to understand we're reading out of the book of Ephesians, and so let's look at how we lead up to uh, the Ephesians chapter 4 where we're at. In chapter 1 of Ephesians, Paul dwells deeply upon the person of Christ, uh, the origin of the church, uh, God's redemptive plan for man in Christ, uh, who is the head over all things and the to the church, which is his body. In chapter 2, he describes the condition of the Ephesians prior to their conversion and how God, through his grace, had reconciled both Jew and Gentile into his one church, the one body, by the sacrifice of Christ, his son, only son, and our Lord. In chapter 3, Paul reveals the function of the one church and the eternal purpose for which he purposed uh, the church and uh, Jesus Christ, and that the Ephesians would be filled with all the fullness of God. And then we begin in chapter 4, which is where we pick up. Paul begins to exhort uh, them in regard to the practical attitudes and the practices which would result in unity as de defined by God in his holy word. So thus in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6, which is where we've been speaking today, it describes the unity that's demanded by Christ. We read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and also verse 7, that the unity for which Christ prayed in John 17 that Jose covered, and to which he directs us today, can be found only in him. So in Christ is the place of unity, the gospel of Christ is the plan of unity, and members of the body of Christ are the people united. Unity then is an obligation inseparably connected with salvation. It's connected with blessings and fellowship with God, and through fellowship with God, fellowship with his children, 
the faithful in Christ. Unity with God, then, is necessary for our entrance into heaven as we remain faithful unto death or until the Lord returns. For all who desire to please God and gain his eternal blessing, unity with God is not optional. We learn in Ephesians 4.1 of the charge to walk worthily or appropriately and deservedly of our calling. We are called by or through the gospel. Paul wrote, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. Paul encouraged the Ephesians to keep on walking worthily, uh, the worthy walk in the gospel, the same gospel with which they were called. Thus they were to walk in the purity and the obedience of a godly life according to the gospel of Christ. We are to walk in the same good news, the same good message that we have today that Lavelle mentioned in the one Bible. That we have in our New Testament today is what we are, how we are to walk. Paul declared in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes and by implication obeys. The disposition the character necessary for oneness in Christ is revealed in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4. First in Ephesians 4, 2 is lowliness, humbleness of mind. It suggests an unselfishness that manifests itself in sacrificial love for the Lord and for others. We are to humble ourselves on the side of the Lord. He shall lift you up, James chapter 4, verse 10. Then we have meekness gentleness by implication humility we are to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls james chapter 1 verse 21 it suggests submission to god and humility with our dealings with others third we have long suffering patience which can be learned i found but uh, we are to put on therefore as the elect of god holy and beloved Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, Colossians 3.12. And last, it mentions forbearance in love, to bear with, to endure one another in agape love, which uh, Weldon covered this morning. Forgetting one, uh, forget, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do ye, Colossians 3.13. Christ forgave them when they repented of their sins, and we should also. It's difficult to act with agape love towards some of those that you do not particularly like. And, you know, you go out in the world and start trying to talk with people, some of them are easier to like than others. But uh, nevertheless, by the command to love, and I might mention agape love is the only kind of love that can be commanded, we are challenged to persistently act with the genuine welfare of others in mind. Uh, we must be concerned for their salvation as we work to bring them unto repentance through God's truth. With these proper attitudes and way of life, Paul admonishes the Ephesians in verse 3 to exercise them properly. They were to endeavor, meaning to give diligence, they were to keep, meaning to watch, to guard, to, or to maintain. What they were to endeavor to preserve was the unity, the oneness of the Spirit, the one Spirit mentioned in verse 4 and author of these verses. They were to do so in the bond of peace, the bond which holds together the seven ones of verses 4 through 6. Paul told the Corinthians to be perfected, be comforted, be of the same mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. But how? I mean, there were a great number of people with varied and different backgrounds and ethnicities uh, to bring into the one body, the one church. And through the years, even to the present day, it's so like that. 
how are they and us today to keep unity and avoid uh, division with all of this differences between the people that you are teaching the gospel? To control these divisions, the inspired apostle presented the perfect standard of unity in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 that we have been discussing all day and will continue to discuss this afternoon. Paul continued by recording certain exhortations to help them and us today to live up to the divine standard of unity, saying just after these verses, not too far down, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a complete man, unto the measure, the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through, uh, through 16, just right past what we're studying here today. But going back to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, with the proper attitudes in mind and a charge to preserve the unity, the oneness of the Spirit, with this disposition of mind and goal in place, Paul introduces the theological platform that is the basis of unity in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. The seven ones are a sevenfold oneness, however you want to, whatever you want to call it. In verses 4 through 6, you'll notice that the exhortation to unity uh, is based on seven unalterable, absolute truths. There is one body and one hope, and only those having the one Lord as the master of lives, the one God as their spiritual father, and who walk according to the one faith, revealed by the one spirit, may have joint participation, that's communion, sharing, and fellowship, in the body having entered in by the one baptism. These seven ones rest on each other, if you just notice from that statement. Either there are seven ones, these absolute truths to be believed in, or there are none of them. You give up any one of them, and you give them all up. The seven ones constitute the unity of the Spirit that we as Christians must diligently uh, keep in the bond of peace. Not one of these is non-essential. Just as crucial, to, it's just as crucial to maintain who the one Lord is as it is to be steadfast and holding to the one faith or the one baptism or to any of the others. Paul gives us these seven ones that are the foundation, the very substance for the unity that we are to keep. They are our doctrinal undergirding, if you want to think of it that way, that cannot be changed or altered in any way. We are joined together in unity in detail the ones, I mean, uh, by the ones that is to be our common ground and foundation that we are to be united on. Given that background, my assigned task today is to discuss in detail the, the one Lord and the one faith found in Ephesians 4, 5, which reads one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. I don't know why I only get two-thirds of that. I don't think it's a coincidence that these three are listed together. Unless you hold to the one faith, you cannot wash away your sins in the one baptism that puts you into Christ, the one Lord, Galatians 3.27. So the first plank, though, that I'm to cover is, is that, uh, the one Lord. The context of Ephesians, which I explained to you earlier, requires us to conclude that the Apostle Paul is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Understanding the Lordship of Jesus is critical in establishing, or understanding and establishing 
the absolute authority by which the unity demanded of his disciples in Ephesians 4 may be realized. In the book of Hebrews, the author in the, in the opening verses presents a perfect claim of entitlement for the authority, the power of Jesus, and therefore his right to command, to expect obedience and submission from the human race says, God, who at sundry times in a diver's manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these that last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, Plant a little flag right there. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels has he said at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. That's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. In our day and age, and especially for our youth, and I'm glad to see several of them here, living in this nation of personal freedoms and prosperity, there is a special need to fully understand the elevation and the adulation, the very praise that's given to Jesus. One way to do that is to consider the points made in God's holy word concerning Jesus' place and power. First, let's consider the fact, the truth, that Jesus is the heir of all things. We just read in Hebrews 1-2. From the beginning, God the Father intended to put all things in subjection under his Son. In describing the reign of his anointed, the psalmist wrote, I will tell of the decree Jehovah said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the nations of thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Psalms chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Jesus was made in all things like unto his brethren. He went about proclaiming the kingdom to come, doing good, healing the sick, and those oppressed by the devil. For this he was hung on the cross in shame. He was buried, but on the third day he rose again, death having no dominion over him. Romans chapter 6 verse 9. Because of his total submission to the Father's will, he was given his inheritance, all authority, replacing the crown of thorns with a royal crown. After Jesus left the tomb and just before he ascended to resume the glory that he had with the Father before the world was, he met with a chosen few on a mountain in Galilee. And there he said, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Think of the entitlement that Jesus claimed being fresh out of the tomb. He said that all authority had been given to him. All of it. All authority in heaven is his. All authority on earth is his. There is no authority that has not been given to Jesus. Because of his total submission to the Father's will, God redeemed his promise recorded in Psalms chapter 2, verse 7 and 8 that we read and made his firstborn heir of all things as we read in Hebrews 1, 2. Consider the fact also, the truth, that Jesus created all things, visible and invisible. Paul wrote, speaking of Jesus, 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Colossians 1, 14, 17. There is no greater display of divine power than was demonstrated and manifested in the creation as described in the first chapter of Genesis. His majesty is clearly seen when he spoke the present system into being. And as we just read, all things consist, meaning they stand and are maintained in their present state. Think about that for a moment. In 144 hours, our Creator brought into existence light, darkness, affirmative, the division of water and land, grass, herbs yielding seed, trees bearing fruit, the sun, the moon, the stars, the seasons, living marine uh, creatures, birds, cattle, creeping things, beasts of the earth, and on the sixth day, man, all created in 144 hours, six days. Today we're surrounded by fools who do not believe that God exists, who are blinded by their gods of this world. They cannot fathom how this could be done and find it too much to believe. Without giving any real attention to the sufficient and conclusive arguments proving that God is, much less his holy word, they have given themselves over to the unprovable and false ideal that the order and design of our universe evolved from nothing over eons of time. Of course, it is amazing to think, actually to know, that the universe came into existence in six literal days, but it did. And the only way to account for Lord's, the Lord's special creation is to recognize the infinite power of God, knowing based on undeniable facts and the truth given us today in our Bibles that God is the eternal, the almighty, we stand amazed in the presence of such strength and glory. Many today do not even think about it. The creation declares the glory of God. And Paul said that Jesus made it all. And so did the Apostle John, writing in John 1, 3, saying, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Also consider the fact, the truth, that Jesus is upholding all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1.3, we read earlier. Here we learn that Jesus sustains and supports the whole universe by the exercise of his will. Our all-powerful, almighty Lord holds together the whole universe and the foundations of our world because he commands it to be so. Now, you youngsters, I want you to listen to this because you probably don't even think about the universe. You look up and see the blue sky. But when you reflect on the vastness of the universe, it seems that it is beyond our ability to appreciate its magnitude and what the Lord is doing by upholding it. I mean, the moon is 240,000 miles away from the earth at its furthest point, And the sun is about 93 million miles from the earth. But all of that is microscopic when you consider the immensity of the universe. When you look at our solar system, which is made up of our sun at the center and nine major and minor planets, if you still count Pluto, you know, Pluto's average distance from the sun is 3.6 billion miles, but that's still peanuts as far as the span of the universe goes. When we ponder distances beyond our solar system, we must think in terms of light years, the distance that light can travel in one year at a rate of 186,000 miles per second. Ben, that's per second, not per hour. 186,000 miles. 
You know how far that is? That's five trillion eight hundred and sixty-five billion seven hundred million miles, roughly. And the nearest star, other than our own sun, to Earth is 4.33 light years away. Stars in the center of the Milky Way, the galaxy that contains our solar system, are 30,000 light years away. But that isn't all. In every direction you can go from here, in directions and get out in space, in every direction, there are galaxies, and yet more galaxies. Astronomers tell us that some nearby galaxies are about 500 million light years away. And the furthest that we know of is 1.5 trillion light years away, distant from Earth. And just to put that into perspective so you understand what I'm talking about, if we could travel in a spaceship at the rate of 186,000 miles per second, the speed of light, it would take 1.5 trillion years to reach the outer limits of man's knowledge of the universe. The universe is big. Think of the countless hosts of heaven, the burning suns, uh, the stars like our own, the planets, the flaming comets, the powerful black holes, the magnificent galaxies, and the outer darkness. The extent of the known universe just staggers the very imagination of man. But as great as it is, Jesus is greater. Our Lord, the Creator, upholds it all with the word of his power. The thing created is never greater than the Creator. The thing upheld and controlled is never more powerful than its governor. The thing ruled over is never greater than its king, whether it be the universe or man himself. How can man, a simple mortal, think of Jesus Christ as a mere historical figure or a prophet of Muhammad or the superstar of some 1970s musical? He is the Lord of glory. He sits on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 1.3 When we think of Jesus, the Son of God, we must do so with an attitude of humility. We should speak of him in tones of reverence and godly fear. He is Lord, the one Lord of Ephesians 4, 5. Excuse me. And last, think also on this fact, the truth, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Jesus, who was God with us during his time on earth, who is so far above us, so mighty and wise, he gave up the glory of heaven to become the babe born of a virgin in Bethlehem. The man, our master teacher, our savior, who knew disappointment, sorrow, loneliness, hunger, tears, and was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. And he died on the cross. He was forsaken. He was abused. He was mistreated. He was beaten, ridiculed, and nailed to a cross. And yet he willingly carried out his father's will and hung there suffered for the better part of a day, and then being in control to the end, he said, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost, Luke 23, 47, 46. Jesus Christ, our mighty maker, 
died for man. For his own creation's sin, he died on the cross. The blood of the lamb did what the blood of bulls and goats could not do. His blood can take away our sins. When we are immersed in water baptism, we are plunged into that fountain that flowed from Emmanuel's veins, and we are washed of our sins. Therefore, having believed that Jesus is the Son of God, repented of our sins, and confessed his name before men, with joy do we obey his command to be baptized, that we might be saved, Mark 16, 16. Therefore, we buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, and the body of sin, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin, Romans 4, verses uh, Romans 6, verses 4 through 6. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the one Lord of Ephesians 4, 5. We need to recognize his authority. We need to unite under his banner of truth. We need to know, love, defend, proclaim, and faithfully keep every command of his that's given to us in the New Testament in the blessed living hope that we may one day be with him in heaven for eternity. So let's now look at the second plank that I've been asked to cover in Ephesians 4 5. The one faith. I mentioned earlier that I don't think it coincidence that the one Lord, uh, the one faith, and the one baptism are listed together. Unless you hold to the one faith, you cannot wash away your sins in the one baptism that puts you into Christ, the one Lord. Galax, uh, Galatians 3.27 Bruce will cover it in more detail, but the one baptism that the one faith proclaims is the Great Commission water baptism of Matthew 28.19 and Mark 16.16. 16. It is far or unto the remission of sins. It enables us to contact the Lord's precious blood to wash away our sins and thus gain entrance into Christ. Whereupon he adds us to his one body, the church. But what exactly is the one faith? If you ask some people if there's one faith, they'll possibly respond that we have all different kinds of beliefs, all different kinds of actions, all different kinds of faiths. And this is why there are so many different groups under the uh, loosely defined umbrella of Christianity. Most people under this umbrella believe and practice different things. Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Catholics, Lutherans, and on and on. They believe and practice different things. Yet some will try to say that we are all the same. It does not matter what you practice or believe. We only need to be sincere in our beliefs. But Paul said there's only one faith. So first let's determine what the fa one faith is not. For example, the one faith is not composed of doctrines and commandments of men. In the New Testament, Jesus frequently confronted the Pharisees of his time on this very point. When Jesus came to deliver the one faith, it was not some warmed over uh, Phariseeism or traditionalism on overhauled and updated to our current times. The one faith is not composed of human philosophy, either ancient or modern. Paul cautioned the saints at Colossae against being captivated with enticing words, Colossians 2.4. He continued warning them, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, Colossians 2.8. The one faith is not composed of creeds and manuals created by man. It is not confessionals. It's not human devised disciplines or catechisms or any religious instructions that are foreign to the Bible. Many people our day follow these documents and give their loyalty to those who wrote them. As dangerous as these are separate from the Bible, 
Now they are incorporated as false doctrine into the modern Bible perversions and promoted by denominations and sold in stores. One faith is not a deleted gospel. It's not a corrupt or altered gospel. It's not a gospel that's been added to by men. Just remember this. If it says less than the Bible, it says too little. If it says more than the Bible, it says too much. If it says the same as the Bible, we don't need it. We have the pure, unadulterated gospel and faithful translations of the New Testament to be our guide to save our souls. So what is the one faith? The one faith of Ephesians 4, 5 is the body of saving truth that we know as the gospel of Christ. Since faith is a prominent part of the gospel that saves is frequently used uh, to refer to the, inner, uh, the entire system of objective truth, a synecdoche where a part is used to represent the whole. And of course, sometimes, as um, uh, someone mentioned earlier, it, sometimes it speaks of the individual faith. But when we see the faith, use this way throughout the Bible and just that's what it's talking about the whole system and just a few verses later in our uh, context here it says Paul refers to the unity of the faith in Ephesians 4 13 meaning the one faith of Ephesians 4 5 and in Galatians 1 23 Paul said he preached the faith which he once destroyed what was he preaching he preached Christ Acts 9 20 this is the same as preaching the word or the gospel as the Great Commission charges. We see Philip preaching the word, preaching Christ, and preaching Jesus in Acts chapter 8, verses 4, 5, and 35. Uh, they were, uh, after being commanded to preach the gospel in Mark 16, 15, it's all the same gospel, the same faith, the one faith. There's one set of revealed teachings from God so we cannot just follow our heart and what we think is right in our eyes. We are commanded to come to the unity of the one faith. We must conform ourselves to the once revealed and delivered teaching of the gospel of Christ. I sense my time is only running out. But I'm going to say this. In our world today, this is where people start having a problem. People will say it's arrogance to declare that there's only one faith. They claim that that kind of thinking is intolerant. Declaring one Lord is already under attack, but now you've crossed the line when you say there's only one faith. How arrogant it is to say only one way, only one faith. But we learn from the gospel there is only one way to live your life and be pleasing to God. There is only one standard. The truth is revealed by the one Lord by which we may save our soul. There is one faith, and man's saving faith is produced by hearing the gospel message, Romans 10, 17. We cannot have faith in unauthorized practices and lay claims to faith in Jesus. Christ, because Jesus delivered only one faith as opposed to many. One truth, not many truth. Truth is not arrogance. Truth is not intolerance. Truth is truth. There are things in life that are absolute. Many day, today need to get over the notion that nothing is absolute. The very fact, uh, the very phrase by itself is, uh, um, should be rejected. When, uh, of course there's truth. But when you say nothing is absolute, that's an absolute statement. And by definition, it should be rejected. There are absolutes. There is knowledge. There is one faith. There is, this is true because God who cannot lie, or he would not be God, because God said so. There is one way. There is one faith. Let's skip down here, David. <laughs> you know, we are to strive for, labor with, and I could read you passages I'll just uh, note them, uh, Philippians 1.27, Colossians 1.23, Jude 3. All of those passages lend the same ideal. Strive for, labor with, endeavor to continue in the one faith and to earnestly contend for the faith, the one faith of Ephesians 4.5. We here today, as well as every congregation of the Lord's church, must determine if we will faithfully continue to carry the banner of truth to promote the gospel life. 
So in closing, the concept is very simple. Jesus has all authority. Jesus is Lord, the one Lord. When I do what I want, I'm saying that there are two Lords, Jesus and myself. When I choose not to do exactly what Jesus said, then Jesus is no longer my Lord. Then we have a problem because God said there is one Lord, and it's not you, and it's not me or anybody else. Unity does not come by disobedience to the law of Christ. Unity does not come by fellowshipping denominations. Nor does unity come by refusing to withdraw from Christians who are no longer in fellowship with God, who cause division and refuse to repent of their sin. Unity is found when we submit to the one Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Submitting to the one Lord leads us to the one faith, the one body of saving truth, which we know as the gospel of Jesus Christ that has been revealed by the one God in Ephesians 4, 6 through the one spirit of Ephesians 4, 4. That is how we achieve unity and fellowship with God and with the faithful who are also in fellowship with God. We cannot do whatever we want to believe outside of that which has been revealed and still have the one faith. We cannot follow our personal preferences and feelings since man's thoughts and feelings are subjective and are not acceptable as a standard of authority. Jeremiah wrote, O Lord, I know the way of man is not himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. We must believe and obey the one Lord and the one faith of Ephesians 4, 5 to find and to keep the unity demanded by Christ in Ephesians 4, verse 5. Thank you. Excellent message and well delivered. I enjoyed very much the reverential awe that was presented in the words of Jack as he dealt with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think we all can marvel at Thomas when Jesus appeared to him and said, put your hands in the nail scars and in my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And our conclusion to this lesson is likened to his, my Lord and my God. We're so appreciative of these good things, and we look forward to hearing our next message. But we